So, <clears throat> up until now, we've discussed fungicides and bactericides and discussed different modes of operation that we can use, either by biocontrol agents or mineral-sourced organic uh, fungicides and bactericides. In this next part, I want to discuss a little bit more about insects. So, insects are of great value and great importance to us as farmers because they confer the most damage to our crops. Eventually, most yield losses are linked in one way or another to insects, either by direct damage that they confer or by um, carrying viruses as vectors to our fields, then increasing uh, the, yeast, uh, the yield loss. And so, first of all, I would like to talk a little bit about a very important approach in organic agriculture, but also in conventional farming called IPM. IPM stands for Integrated Pest Management. And in general, this approach is a collection of different uh, disciplines or different uh, strategies that we can use um, as a mixture of different cultural practices to fight off against insects. For example, <clears throat> the idea is that we use uh, different steps and only once we exhaust all the different steps, the cultural steps and the use of bio, bio, biological control agents, only then that we apply insecticides. So insecticides use is not a routine practice, but rather as a last resort that we take only after we exhausted all other options that we use as one holistic approach against the insects. For example, we can use pheromones and other attractants to attract the insect into a trap. Uh, for example, you can see that in a lot of organic farms, you will see yellow bottles containing a pheromone that attracts um, the pest. Then the pest will enter this bottle or trap and we can remove it, push it away from our crop. We can also use biological control agents against uh, insects. Uh, and we can um, try to attract the natural enemies of the plant. The main uh, takeaway message is that we use a mix mixture of different approaches and strategies and, of course, using insecticides only when we have no other option. But the idea is to maintain a low pest population that will be below the economically damaging level. So. Basically, we cannot eliminate all the pests in the field. This is impossible to do. What we want to do is lower the population level to such uh, uh, a degree that we can actually uh, not lose money and make enough yield for us. If the population level is higher than the economically damaging level, then we should reconsider and um, uh, make more severe uh, options to eliminate the level to lower it down. So we cannot eliminate uh, entirely, we can only hope to maintain the level lower than the economical uh, damaging levels. And now let's see how it is done. So basically what stands in the base of IPM, or more to the point the cultural practices of IPM, is that we want to conserve the beneficial insects, the pollinators, the natural enemies, and in parallel to push away the pest. So how can we do that? So <clears throat> in order to do that, we need to know our insects. We need to gain knowledge and to become smarter about the way that we apply the IPM. This is what we are doing now. We are learning tools in order to be better organic farmers. So when we are talking about knowledge about our insects, what does it mean? First of all, we need to know what are the insect habitats and food in our specific area. We need to know where does the pest come from, where, where, where is its natural habitat, and how is it attracted to the crop. So is it attracted to the flowers, is it attracted to the leafy part, is it attracted to the fruit, we also need to know which factors influence the pest abundance, meaning at what specific time, what specific season is the uh, uh, 
season in which the higher population and also higher damage uh, abilities of the insect are. Um, we, it is very, very important to know uh, what is the natural enemy, the predators, the parasitoids of our pests, what, uh, where they are, I mean, which, uh, of course, which kind of insect are they? Are they available in our farm or our area? Can we source them from some companies in our country? And we also need to know more about the predator or parasite's life cycle and their abilities to um, uh, attack our pest. We can uh, gain a lot of knowledge from knowing more about can they use other food sources and um, uh, the population sizes and so on. Um, uh, like I've mentioned before, uh, we need to know more about critical resources such as alternative uh, uh, food sources for the natural enemies and uh, shelter for the natural enemies that we can use at the right time in order to lower the population size of our pest. So let's talk first about natural enemies. What we actually need to provide them, apart from um, um, either predating, eating, or uh, infecting the, our pest, we need to think about two main things. One is an alternative food source. So this uh, includes, for example, nectar from flowers or extra floral nectaries that we can see in a lot of types of crops. Uh, we can provide them with alternative preys. <clears throat> And the other thing that we need to know and to provide for these natural enemies is a habitat. So this could be a habitat that is um, another type of plant. Some of these natural enemies build their houses uh, inside the soil or on trees or on dead wood. Others, such as uh, social insects, usually need some type of artificial hive or shelter that we can provide for them, like you see in the picture. So like we've mentioned, mentioned before, natural enemies need food other than the population of the pests that uh, we are trying to target. So different types of food sources could be flowers that provide nectar, pollen. There are also the option of extra floral nectaries that some uh, plants such as acacia produce. So these are nectaries or sugar sources that are available for the uh, natural enemy, but not in the flower. So it could be from the leaf or from the stems or from uh, nodes of the plant. And of course, we have the pollen, which also comes from the flowers. So this is a very good source for protein and sugar for um, many types of natural enemies. In these few slides, we will discuss a little bit about how to provide or strategies to provide uh, uh, shelter and food source for the natural enemies. If you remember, we've discussed in the previous lessons the strategies of intercropping or cover crops. These are uh, type of strategies that allow us to grow crops either within the rows of our cash crop or between the lines, between the rows of our uh, cash crops. Usually they provide biodiversity, they provide as a cover against weeds, and they can also provide natural um, uh, method for uh, uh, providing us with nutrients that are beneficial for the cash crop, like in the case of legumes grown together with cereals. Another option is to use uh, uh, field bo borders, or these are actually uh, lines that, of plants that we grow in the periphery of our plot that will provide a natural food source and a shelter for the natural enemies. So let's look at one very, very elegant and interesting example of this principle. So in the top left picture, you can see a, um, a field of lettuce, Roman lettuce grown in California in the United States. One major problem in lettuce is aphids that we can also find in other types of crops as a main pest. Aphids can suck uh, phloem and uh, removing water and sugar from the plant, thus reducing the yield, and they can also uh, serve as vectors for viral diseases. What they've chose to do in this example is to grow 
a type of brassica plant uh, called alisum as a cover crop between the lines of the uh, romaine lettuce. So what this uh, alisum plants, the white flowering plant, does is provide shelter or a house as well as a food source for a type of fly called sylphid fly. So the adults are uh, living on the alisum plants, consuming the pollen, and then laying the eggs on the um, on the um, aphid infested romaine because the uh, larvae of this sylphid fly can feed on the aphids. And so the flies, the adult flies are uh, are um, living and consuming the alisum plants, providing them with nutrients and shelter, then laying the eggs on the, uh, on the romaine lettuce because they know that the romaine lettuce has a lot of aphids on them, which will serve as a food source for the young stages, for the larvae. And uh, this is actually a very beneficial method, and even uh, conventional farmers have reported that they can reduce dramatically the amount of uh, insecticides that they have to use only by using this method, by applying a cover crop which provides shelter and alternative food source uh, for the natural enemy of the aphids. Another IPM strategy is to um, plant different flowers on either the periphery of our plot or as a cover crop the lines of our cash crop in order to provide pollen and nectar for the natural enemies. This is mostly used in leafy, uh, leafy uh, uh, crops and also in strawberries. Um, in this case you can see on the on the right this is a celery as a, as a leafy uh, green and um, this also provides a shelter for the natural enemies and pushing away the uh, the, the pests from our cash crop by providing a food source and a shelter for our natural enemies. Some, type of, some types of natural enemies can be very efficient against our pests in reducing the population level, but it requires uh, another prey as their food source. So they cannot use um, uh, pollen or or nectar as an alternative food source once they reduce the population level of the pest. For example, what we can see here in tomatoes, in greenhouse tomatoes, um, the uh, parasitoid that is used to reduce the population level of the white fly, the white fly is the pest of the tomato, cannot use an alternative food source which is pollen uh, or leaf or nectar. And so the solution in this case is to grow a second, a second crop, in this case the papaya plants, and the papaya plants host another type of aphid. This uh, papaya aphid is not dangerous for our tomatoes. However, they serve as an alternative food source for the parasitoid once they reduce the population level uh, of the, uh, our cash crop. So instead of reapplying the population ever so often, uh, because if they don't have any food source, they will die off and we will have to use another generation of parasitoids. So to solve this problem, we can plant the papaya a tree and uh, maintain a population of an alternative food source, in this case, uh, aphids that are not dangerous for or marginally dangerous for our uh, crop and thus we can maintain the, the two populations at a good level. Another very elegant approach is not to provide uh, um, shelter for the natural enemies, but rather push away our pest from the cash crop into a different crop that is more attractive to the pest. So in this case, on the left, you can see rows of strawberries on the sides and in the middle alfalfa. For some pests of the strawberries, the alfalfa flowers and nectar is more, um, uh, more attractive and uh, seems to be um, um, 
uh, more efficient and so we actually can push away the pests from our cash crop by providing a more attractive uh, uh, cover crop uh, to push away the, the pests from, from the strawberries. Another type of cultural practices that we can use is actually exploiting the biology and uh, behavior of the insects against them. One example is to uh, use the cover or, or the um, uh, periphery of our net house or greenhouse with a material that can either block or reflect UV. This actually causes uh, less UV radiation to enter our greenhouse or net house thus prevent insects and pests into coming into the greenhouse. The reason is, is a lot of kinds of insects rely on UV radiation to navigate and to move. And once they don't see this wavelength, they generally uh, don't tend to enter the greenhouse or the net house. Uh, in addition, we can use reflective mulch. Reflective mulch is a type of um, cover for the soil for example, reflective aluminum, that either deters or um, confuses the insect, thus preventing it from landing on the plants. It is most useful when the plants are relatively uh, small or that they don't actually cover the soil. So for instance, in tomatoes, it could be very useful, but in other plants, such as leafy greens, it's less effective because then the mulch will be eventually covered by the large plants. So now let's talk more in detail about the biological controls that we can use in organic farming. So actually these are insects or um, actually pathogens of insects that we can use uh, in our field. Uh, some of them we can source commercially and some of them we can um, actually attract from our environment. Like we've mentioned before, it is very useful to know uh, of course, a lot about your pest, but also a lot about the natural enemy of the pest. So if it is present in our uh, environment, we can ensure uh, conditions that will uh, provide us with natural enemies against our pest. So many biological control agents are host-specific, meaning they will attack a specific type of pest, and they allow the targeting of specific pests, and as we'll see ahead, also specific stages of the pest because not uh, all stages are harmful for our crops and uh, some stages are more sensitive than others. Uh, some biological control agents could reduce and prevent populations of the pests and secondary pests and this is a, generally a good solution for organic farmers but also for um, um, conventional farmers because they provide a good solution against pests that uh, over time develop resistance to chemical insecticides. So when we are talking about natural enemies against our pests that are insect as well, we have two main kinds. One is predators and the other is parasitoids. So first let's discuss the predators. As you know, generally in nature, the predators are larger than their prey. This is a principle that you can see in all different trophic levels and all ecological uh, systems. Uh, usually, uh, one predator can consume a lot of different prey, and they are actively searching for the prey. So usually they can move, they can sense where the prey is, and they can look for it. They often attack different life stages of the pest. So let's say we have one predator or one stage of predator can, can target different life stages of the pest, caterpillars, eggs, uh, adults, larvae. And uh, in many predators, also different life stages of the predator could be uh, beneficial against the, the pest. So not only the adult or not only the larvae, but also different life stages. Uh, many predators are also uh, able to supplement their diet, like we've seen before, by feeding on alternative food sources. So this could be other type of, of insects or um, uh, plant parts such as nectar, pollen, um, 
and uh, and leaves of uh, of of uh, the crop. So one limitation of predators it is usually they require higher population of their prey to work effectively. So what it means is usually once they clean them off or actually lower the population size, they will uh, disappear or search for another food source. So we have to remember that we have to maintain the, uh, the predator populations by either providing them with an alternative food source, like we've seen before, such as nectar or pollen from another plant, or maintaining populations of a secondary insect so they can consume once the population level of the pests is reduced, or we need to reapply them once uh, again we see the pest uh, populations again became higher. The main groups of predators are spiders, predatory bugs, predatory mites, lacewings, beetles, and hoverflies.
Andlodromalus lamonicus is widely used for the biological control of thrips. It is capable of controlling high infestations quickly and effectively due to its great reproductive capacity. Amblodromalus pierces its prey with its mouthparts and then sucks out the contents. Unlike other predatory mites, Amblodromalus also eats the larger thrips larvae and is active at lower temperatures. The mites can reproduce while feeding on non-prey food sources such as pollen. This allows them to build up populations before pests are present. Curious about other beneficials? Check out the second group of the natural uh, enemies that are insects themselves is called parasitoids. These are usually wasps or flies that either live on the body, the skin of the pest, or inside the pest uh, for uh, one or two periods of the life cycle. So usually the immature uh, stages, the larvae, the eggs, live on the host or inside of the host, while the adults are free living and mobile when they are reproducing and infecting the next stage of the uh, pest. So some limitations or concern regarding parasitoids. First of all, they tend to be smaller uh, than, the, um, than the host. Um, usually, one problem is that the, uh, the host dies more slowly. So when a predator consumes the, the host, the, 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 the uh, insect or our pest, usually it kills them off instantaneously by consuming them. But parasitoids require some stage of hibernation. For example, eggs or larvae that live inside or on the skin of the insect, and then they will, uh, the, the target, the, the host or the pest, will die more slowly. Uh, some hosts can be paralyzed, while others uh, uh, will die eventually in a matter of days or weeks. Another concern is basically only half of the population is effective against the, the, um, the pest because only the female searches and lays the, its eggs on the host inside of it or on the uh, shell on, or the skin. The adult forms often require an alternative food source because they do not consume, they do not feed on the, on the host. So they require some alternative food source such as pollen or nectar. And another concern is a lot of these parasitoids are also vulnerable to pesticides that are used um, to spray or cover our cash crop. On contrast, the benefits is that parasitoids often complete their life cycle very quickly compared to predators, and they increase their numbers really faster. You have to remember that uh, in prey-predator uh, dynamics, usually the, the predators are larger, but they have smaller numbers of population. Parasitoids are usually smaller than the, the host, but the population sizes is really big and they can increase and infect in parallel much more effectively than the predators. Another benefit is that they are considered mostly host-specific and they will often attack only when one species of the pest is uh, present. And then you can know actually that the parasitoids, parasitoids are only effective against your species and they will not try to search for an alternative uh, host in your uh, plot or field. Our parasitized caterpillar has spent the last 12 days gorging itself. It now appears profoundly obese. But this is not all fat. The glomerata wasp larvae lie just under its skin. Each is the size of a grain of rice, but together they account for over a third of the caterpillar's weight. The larvae have not yet finished growing.
and need to keep their host alive. So although they feast on the caterpillar's blood, they have been careful not to touch a single one of its vital organs. This uneasy truce will not last. Within days, the larvae are fully matured. Suddenly, they begin to stir into action. For the past two weeks, this surrogate womb has protected them, but now they no longer need it to complete the next stage of their life cycle. They must break out. The caterpillar's thick skin should be a solid barrier to the parasitic wasp larvae. But as their bodies have grown, they have developed tiny saw-like teeth. These jagged jaws are for one job only, cutting their way out. Stroke by stroke, the larvae slice through the tough layers of skin. At the same time, they release chemicals that paralyze the caterpillar. As the larvae break through, there is nothing it can do. Free at last, the larvae enter a new phase of development. They swiftly spin silken cocoons. These will provide the perfect environment for their final transformation. But ironically, one of the greatest dangers the larvae will face is being themselves impregnated by other species of parasitic wasp. Incredibly, the wounded caterpillar helps them out. Usually, a caterpillar would spin a silken blanket to make its own cocoon. But the parasitized caterpillar spins his blanket on top of the wasp cocoons giving them an extra layer of protection. Scientists believe the same wasp virus that infected it weeks before has now invaded the caterpillar's brain and caused this bizarre corruption of its normal behavior. Amazingly, the caterpillar's natural aggression is now also exploited by the wasp virus. caterpillar becomes a bodyguard, actively protecting the cocoons from other parasites. It will watch over them Microscopic battles between tiny predators and prey are raging across the British countryside all the time. And without them, we'd be overrun with pests. One aphid, if it was left to reproduce unchecked, could become billions in just one season. Well, clearly the natural system works, otherwise I might be knee-deep in aphids and other pests right now. But what happens if you bring the outside in? Large-scale greenhouse growing is big business in the UK. This way farmers can satisfy demand for all year round produce. It may protect them from the weather, but it doesn't protect them from the same old pests. A big outbreak of aphids could be potentially devastating to us as a business and, and the crop because uh, it would dramatically reduce the marketable yield of tomatoes that we have. Would you ever consider using pesticides here? We'd really try not to. They're 
pretty unacceptable to the general public and they're expensive to apply. Instead, Peter and the vast majority of greenhouse farmers around the country have turned to more natural and ingenious control methods. In this little tube is a batch of dead aphids and by sprinkling them over the tomato plants we're rather bizarrely protecting them from aphid infestation. Sound strange? Well, this is where it gets even weirder. In our studio, we're placing these dead aphids under a macro lens, and with the help of Chris Jeffs from Oxford University, we're going to see how they're helping farmers. We're looking for a big black mass inside of the dead aphid. Oh, ooh, 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 ooh. That looks like a leg or antenna of something. Yep, it's this definitely is... moving. Inside the dead aphid here, we actually have another species of insect. Ooh, and that insect is a parasitic wasp. Emergence can take hours. We want to find one that's already started the process. Ooh, it started. Look, yeah, look, it's chewing its way out of the aphid. The heads are already antennae. I mean, that's actually quite gruesome, isn't it? You've got a live wasp emerging from the dead remains of its aphid host. She's virtually out. Yep. One last push, and she's free. That's it. But how did the wasp get inside a dead aphid? This wasp is aphidious, so-called because it has an uncanny ability to track down aphids and a gruesome way of dealing with them. And there's a nice pile of aphids for her. Sensing the aphids, she then checks them out with her antennae and begins the attack. Oh, oh look. look. There oh, you yes. go. She's that got it. quick. It's over in a fraction of that a second. That was quick. She then continues on a rampage. There again, again. Oh, it's fantastic. She brings her abdomen between her legs and stabs each aphid in turn. You might think that the wasp actually stings the aphid and it might die, but, but of course it isn't that, is it? Their sting is what they use to lay the egg inside the aphid. This is a dead aphid that had an egg laid inside it ten days ago. What we can see is the eggs now hatched and this here is actually the larvae of the parasitoid. Can it's you moving, see it? It's moving. It keeps its host alive, so it can feed on its tissues inside, but it only eats the vital organs last. It keeps it alive as long as it can. Two weeks later, time for the process to start again. And that's just one. Like, imagine each wasp can lay about three, four hundred eggs at a time. You can really see how you can just decimate aphids in your greenhouses or your crops. By utilising this natural behaviour, farmers up and down the country now have the helping hands of these wonderful wasps, helping to keep British veg. Wasp in Carcia formosa was the only natural enemy used against whitefly. It is capable of using various species of whitefly as hosts. The female deposits her egg in older stages of the whitefly larvae. Once Incarcia has located a larva, it determines whether it is suitable to parasitize or use as food. When Incarcia parasitizes, a new wasp will develop inside the host larva. About halfway through this process, the host larva turns black. When the adult wasp emerges, it eats a round hole in the pupal skin. Curious about other beneficials? Check out our YouTube channel. So uh, up until now we've discussed biological control agents that are actually insects such as uh, predators and parasitoids. 
in this uh, part of the presentation, we'll talk about pathogens. So these are uh, actually microorganisms, fungi, viruses, bacteria, and nematodes um, that can infect the pest, killing it eventually. The first part, uh, the first type of pathogen that we'll discuss is Bacillus thuringiensis, or BT in short. This is one of the most common and most effective uh, biological control agents, which are pathogens against pests. So BT is a bacterium that can be found virtually in every environment. Usually they are found on, uh, in soil, and uh, it lives in the soil as a spore. So eventually, at one time point, the insect will eat this spore, and the spore will start to germinate in the gut of the insects. The BT is very uh, target-specific and usually prefers caterpillars, flies, and mosquitoes. Um, the BT, uh, once it starts to, to, um, to reproduce and germinate in the gut of the insect, will start to produce a highly effective toxin that destroys the insect gut. Then the BT bacteria will enter uh, the um, inside or the uh, organs of the insect and uh, start to uh, decay and, and um, destroy the cells of the insect from within. It is safe for consumption by mammals and humans. It is not, this toxin is only effective against insects. But you have to remember that it has to be eaten by the insect. And so it has to be applied when and where the insect is visually uh, appeals. When we try to observe the efficiency of the BT, we can see that it is very effective against different types of um, insects or pests in different kinds of crops. So, for example, we can see that uh, in the diamondback moss, it is very, very effective. But for other types of um, crops, for example, uh, uh, sorry, other type of pests, such as the European corn boil or... Um, uh, let's say, for example, uh, the harlequin bug, it is less considered less effective. But in general, we can say that BT is one of the most uh, effective uh, pathogen against um, insects. Another type of pathogen is a fungus called Bassiana. So Bassiana is a fungus that can be found commonly uh, in soils in uh, generally all of the world. So the, um, what happens in this case is the Bassiana is not uh, entering the insect sat, like what we saw in the BT through the gut, but rather uh, from the um, uh, skin or the uh, coat of the insect. So the mode of operation is that the fungal spores are attached to the insect skin. They start to germinate and bore inside of the insect uh, uh, coat, the cuticle, and through these um, holes that it perforates the, the cuticle, it starts to send the hyphae germinating inside of the insect body and starts to reproduce. Um, what happens is the um, uh, mycelia of the germinating spores will start to absorb um, the uh, nutrients from the cells of the insect uh, causing them eventually the cells to die and thus uh, between three and five days, the insect will die, and then new spores will arrive uh, from the fungi, and then the fungi will reproduce to find another insect. Um, also, you can uh, you have to remember that this fungi can uh, infect, so one insect can infect another insect with the with these spores, and thus uh, proliferate in the population of the insects. It has to be applied only when the insect is seen on the plant, similarly to what we've seen with the BT, and it is most effective against younger stages because you have to remember that younger stages, uh, actually the, the, the cuticle is much softer, which makes the part of the um, perforating or making these small holes uh, through which the mycelia will start to grow more easily compared to insects with uh, harder shells.
Another type of pathogen that we'll discuss now is NPV or nuclear polyhedrosis virus. So this virus is a very, uh, can persist very stably for many, many years in the soil due to a very uh, um, protective protein crystal structure around the virus that protects it from the environment. And as we said, NPV can persist for many years in the environment such as the soil or other um, uh, dead uh, um, uh, plant parts. And um, it could be also killed by exposure to ultraviolet light in sunlight. So it, ha it, can, it has the ability to stay uh, concealed in the soil for many years. Um, and it is not harmful for humans or other uh, insects, so it is mostly very uh, species-specific. So how does NPV work? Basically, once the insect will um, ingest or eat these, the, the viral particles with the virus inside, the outer crystal structure will dissolve in the gut. And then it will release the virus particles, the, the actually uh, the genetic material of the virus inside the larvae. So what happens next is the viruses enter the nucleus of the infected cells, hijack uh, the metabolism of the cell and produce a lot of new um, virus particles. Actually, you know that viruses are either RNA or DNA and they can use the host um, cell or more specifically the host nucleus in order to produce more viruses. So it, it actually hijacks the nucleus in order to produce more viruses. Then the cells start uh, over time to produce new crystal structures, the, the outer shell that protects the viruses. And so these crystals start to accumulate within the insect. So NPV actually between four and seven days, depending on temperature and the uh, initial dosage, can kill the, um, the host. And then the, the next generation of the viruses uh, can be transmitted to the environment, uh, thus infecting new populations of insects. So the dynamics of this disease in insect uh, shows us that after ingesting the NPV, the, uh, the host will usually eat normally for a couple of days, but then the eating behavior starts to reduce. What happens next is usually uh, the virus actually affects the behavior of the insect, causing it to uh, go higher, to um, uh, climb to the top of the plant. And at this stage, the um, crystal structures that are formed are reproduced in such high numbers that actually they will rupture the skin of the caterpillar and then they will release millions of new infectious virus enclosed in this crystal structure. Another advantage of this uh, virus is, is that uh, one insect can actually infect another insect. So transmitting the disease between the populations of the pests. Okay, so in this part, we'll talk a little bit about organically certified insecticides. Like we've mentioned before, insecticides are not recommended to use routinely as a routine in your field, but rather as a last resort after we exhausted all the different possibilities that we've mentioned before. The reason is, is because insecticides usually disrupt the balance between beneficial and pest species. So if we have a beneficial insect in our field, let's say pollinator or a natural enemy, you have to remember that there is a high chance that it, it will also be affected negatively by the insecticide. Another problem is that usually after a while, if you use the same type of insecticides in a large scale, the insects uh, are developing resistance against these uh, insecticides. So it actually represents only a um, temporary uh, solution for our problem and not a permanent solution. And we have to remember that even though um, these insecticides are organically certified, um, or abusing them or using them too much can be also harmful for other animals or and for the environment. So now let's discuss a little bit about um, organically certified um, 
pesticides that we can use in our field. The first one that we want to talk about is kaolin clay. Kaolin clay is actually a natural occurring clay that we can find in our soils or we can source organically. And the way that it works is actually by forming a physical barrier that prevents the insect from uh, consuming um, the, uh, the leaf or laying the eggs. And it is also uh, acts as a repellent by creating an unsuitable surface, actually deterring the feeding or egg laying uh, behavior of the pest. Um, since uh, kaolin clay is uh, dis uh, soluble in water, the efficiency is only maintained if you reapply it uh, every once in a while because it is washed away uh, in overhead irrigation uh, or if we have rainfall or if we have a growth of uh, new growth of the plant which was not previously covered in the, in the clay. Another concern is that the white film that uh, is visible on the leaf or the fruit uh, reduces the marketability, so the, the consumers might be um, deterred from buying this type of, uh, of product. So it has to be washed before you can uh, put it in the market. And so <clears throat> the main benefit is it is uh, efficient against uh, types of maggots, caterpillars and leaf hoppers. Of course, only when it is applied um, again and again and applied um, in a way that actually covers the whole leaf area. Of course, you have to remember another benefit is that it is non-toxic. You know that even children play with clay and it is uh, applied where we live, for example, by um, in construction. So it, it is considered uh, mostly uh, non-toxic to humans. Another type of uh, organic insecticide and one of the most efficient ones even used in a lot of cases in uh, conventional farming is neem oil. So basically the neem oil is an oil that is extracted from the fruits and the seeds of the neem tree which grows um, in uh, southern East uh, Asia and uh, also the Middle East. Um, this oil uh, uh, contains a compound that is called azadirachtin. The, the, uh, this compound actually acts as an insect growth regulator or actually inhibiting the growth of uh, specific insects. It also acts as an anti-feeding uh, agent because it deters or pushes away the insects from eating uh, the leaf and also um, reduces the egg laying behavior of the insect. Um, usually, these, uh, the neem oil is more effective against immature stages of insects uh, compared to the mature uh, um, levels. So application of neem oil can be done either by uh, spraying it on the leaves. Uh, some farmers have actually um, reported that it is most effective when after you rinse the leaves once with spray them with water and then apply the neem oil. But it could also be applied through the roots of the system. So many farmers have special tools for which they are uh, using some sort of funnel or, or, or um, some sort of pipe in order to uh, inject or introduce the neem oil to the uh, roots of the plant. Thus, the uh, neem oil moves uh, systemically through the um, uh, transportation tissues like the xylem and phloem and then it can be present in the leaf and the stems of the uh, crop. Another type of insecticides are oils or petroleum oils. These are usually the byproducts of the petroleum industry. So actually, these oils, what they are doing is they are covering uh, the uh, outer cuticle of the, of the insects. You know that insects um, exchange gases. They actually breathe not by lungs like uh, mammals do, but rather through small holes in the cuticle called trachea. So actually what the oil does is covering the trachea, preventing from air to entering the insect. So in eggs of insects, it can prevent the exchange of gases through the egg surface and interfering with the egg structure. 
and in young and adults, they block, as we mentioned before, the respiratory system, this small trachea in the cuticle of uh, uh, the insect. Actually, what this oil does is suffocating the insect. Um, in some cases, it can deter the, um, the insect from laying eggs and from feeding. And it is uh, sometimes added to other pesticides to increase the efficiency. Uh, some oils can be phytotoxic to our crops, so it has to be used in um, not uh, uh, too much high dosage. The reason is, is some oils can uh, disrupt the outer cuticles of the leaves as well as the insects. So as you can see from this graph, um, petroleum oils are not super efficient, but they have some good results in caterpillars and mites. Another very similar uh, application is pesticidal soap. So basically these soaps are either potassium or ammonium salts coupled with fatty acids. Very similar to what we know of um, commercial uh, home soaps that have um, uh, used as, actually as detergents. It has one part which, which is hydrophobic and the other part is hydrophilic. Um, actually, pesticidal soaks, what they do is they disrupt the cuticle layer and similarly to what we see with oils, they are coating um, the uh, insect and suffocating it. So the solution must be in contact uh, and uh, thoroughly cover the target pest only when and where we see the, these pests. Um, it is not useful to just spray it uh, before the insect comes before b because uh, once the soap dries on the plant surface, insect will not be affected by these uh, pesticidal soaps. It is effective against aphids, mealybugs, white flies, mites, and other soft-bodied species, and it is not so effective against more hard-bodied insects, which have very thick cuticle like beetles. Another type of insecticide, which is the most interesting kind, is called pyrethrum. This is actually an extract from um, powdered dried flower heads of the pyrethrum daisy. It's a plant from the Compositaea family of uh, plants. It is used widely throughout the world to control many human and household pests, uh, for example, mosquitoes and houseflies. And actually what it does, it knocks down the nervous system of the insect, causing it to paralysis and later on to death. So in lower doses, it can cause paralysis, but others, after some time, the insect will recuperate and um, continue to consume uh, or uh, affect our crop. But in higher dosages, it can cause to the death of the insect. It is considered quite broad spectrum and affects true bugs, caterpillars, beetles, aphids, uh, flies, uh, trips, and so on. Um, this product um, has been uh, tested for a lot of different kinds of crops and pests. And you can actually find online very detailed um, uh, results of studies that have effect, um, tested the efficiency in combinations of different crop and pests and uh, will present the efficiency in terms of percentages. So you can actually find this uh, table and actually more detailed uh, uh, essays that were conducted online. Um, <clears throat> so in this uh, movie, the idea is just to look how they grow it as a biofertilizer. In this video, they already put a product of uh, pyrethrum inside the, the glass and then they add a cockroach. You don't have to see it all, you just can see how it's affecting even the biggest insects we can have. Okay, moving on. So the next um, product that I want to talk about is called Spinosad. This is actually an extraction of um, chemical compounds that are found in the bacterial species Saccharopolyspora spinosa. Um, the, the 
Chemical contents of this bacteria can affect the nervous system of the insect, causing it to loss of muscle control and death. Spinosad is uh, actually toxic to plant-eating insects, uh, such as caterpillar, beetles, trips, and flies. It is not considered um, a biological control agent because we don't actually release the bacteria or, or introduce the, bac the living bacteria in the field, but rather uh, we are extracting this compound uh, from the bacteria, after which the bacteria will be dead, but we are exploiting the chemical contents and then applying it on the field. Usually it's the, the contents, uh, this, this extract is broken down fast by sunlight and irradiation, as well as being um, broken down by uh, microorganisms in the environment of the plant. Welcome to Pestivites from the National Pesticide Information Center at Oregon State University. Hi, I'm Colton with the National Pesticide Information Center, here to talk with you about Spinosad. We'll talk about what it is, how it works, and its toxicity. Spinosad is a nerve toxin that is made by a soil microbe. It causes the insect's muscles to flex uncontrollably. They become paralyzed and die over the course of one or more days. Spinosad can be used to kill a variety of insects. It is found in over 80 pest control products. It is used on plants, in homes, in aquatic settings, or as seed treatment. When spinosad lands on surfaces or in water, sunlight breaks it down quickly. Spinosad also is broken down by soil microbes, and this happens more quickly near the soil surface. Finally, spinosad does not move well from leaves to other parts of plants, through the soil towards groundwater, or into the air. Now that you know a little bit more about what spinosad is, let's discuss its toxicity to people. The risk of having a problem because of a pesticide depends on the toxicity of the chemical, how much we're exposed to, the way we are exposed, and how sensitive we are. Therefore, all pesticides have some level of risk. Spinosad can get into your body if you eat it, touch it, or breathe it in. Once inside your body, most of it is broken down and rapidly leaves. However, spinosad can irritate the eyes and skin. In long-term animal studies, spinosad did not lead to the development of cancer. But what about other long-term effects? Check out our fact sheet online or give us a call. These studies are interesting but harder to summarize quickly. Remember, pregnant women and other folks can always reduce their risks by reducing their exposure to any pesticide. Also, while children may be more sensitive to pesticides, there are no studies showing that children are especially sensitive to spinosad. Among wildlife, the toxicity of spinosad can vary greatly. Spinosad is low in toxicity to mammals and birds. In fish, it ranges from low to moderate toxicity. However, it is very highly toxic to bees and oysters. Finally, let's discuss some ways that you can keep your risk low. Because with every pesticide application, there is a level of risk to both you and the environment. Consider all of your options before you use a pesticide. These would be things like removing food, shelter, and water, and blocking entry points for pests. If you've decided to apply a product, Always follow the label instructions. In the case of spraying plants in your garden, think about applying during calm weather and keeping others inside until the chemical has settled out of the air and dried on surfaces. For an indoor application, make sure that baits are absolutely inaccessible to children and pets. Thanks for watching. Remember, you can call us or check out our website to dig deeper. Pestibites are brought to you by the National Pesticide Information Center.
Inosad is considered highly efficient against caterpillars and beetles, and less efficient against other types of insects. I want to remind you uh, that um, you have very good online resources to uh, review um, different types of organic certified um, insecticides, such as the OMRI. So this is the res online resource of Organic Materials Review Institute uh, that um, shows and details a lot of different organically certified um, products that you can use on your field and to have more knowledge about the efficiency in different crops and in combination of different pests. Okay, let's, let me ask you some questions. So first of all, when are the most important times to control weeds? A. Whenever they start to emerge. B. When our plants are small and before the weeds uh, disperse the seeds. C. Before harvesting and to prevent mixing. And D. When the fruit set to control the pests. So what do you think? Very good. The answer is B. When our plants are small and before the weed disperses the seeds. Basically, uh, what we want to do is to um, find the time in which the herbicide is most effective. This is the time when the plants are relatively small, they are not woody, and they don't have a uh, overdeveloped cuticle at this time. Of course, we want to do that before they disperse the seeds, otherwise we'll only uh, have this problem again next season. Another question, how do we provide an alternative food source for the natural enemies? A. To plant flowers with nectars and pollens as a food for them. B. To grow the plant pests for them. C. To spray pollen in the field. Or D. To apply dead pests in the field. What do you think? Okay, let's look at the answer. Very good. A. We need to plant flowers with nectars and pollens as food sources. So I want to mention that what we see before, uh, for example, with the alisum. You remember that we had the lettuce field and then we also, as a cover crop, had the alisum. The problem was that the uh, lettuce had the aphids. The aphids um, uh, reduces the yields and then, as a natural enemy, we use the, uh, the flies. And the flies uh, actually, the adult stages of the fly used uh, the alisum plant, eating the pollen and the nectar, and then it lays the eggs on the um, lettuce. The caterpillars, the younger stages of the flies, uh, eat the aphids, and then uh, we actually can provide an alternative food source for the natural enemy and maintaining the populations close to us. Okay, so... Another question, what are the characteristics of parathesoids? Okay, A, they have a long life cycle. B, they prey on all stages. C, the male and female are predators. Or D, they are sensitive to pesticides. So what do you think? Okay, let's look at the answer. D. They are sensitive to pesticides. This is one of the problems. So let's look at the answers and see what, why is it not A. So they have a long life cycle? No, it's not true. They have a very fast life cycle and the population grows very, very fast, as you've seen in the movie with the parasitoid wasps. They prey on all stages? No. Usually they prey on one stage. So, for example, the caterpillar or the larvae. C. The male and female are predators? No. Usually, neither of them are predators, but actually only half of the population, which are the females, are effective against the host because the females are actively searching for the host in order to lay the eggs inside or on the cuticle of the host. Okay, guys, I want to thank you for participating in this lesson, and I wish uh, you have a very good time in uh, reading and learning about organic agriculture, and I wish you a very healthy stay. And uh, let's stay in touch. Bye-bye.